Um, so I recognize that a lot of people here are in a different place in their vegan journey. You might have recently found out that you know you want to give up meat. You might already be vegetarian. You might already have transitioned to veganism. You might be an activist. You might be an activist every weekend. Um, what I'm trying to get people to understand, and I'm going to take us and guide us there, is that right now our vegan consumerism is getting undermined by our tax dollars. And so I'm going to show, I'm going to build context to this, and I'm going to show us how to solve it. It's not something we can ignore any longer, or else the, at the point in time we're at right now, the cadence of bailouts are so giant that they are, they are literally wiping clean of all loss. So to get us started, I'm going to kick us off with a quote. The food system, the food supply has been instrumental for defining the haves and the have-nots throughout human history. It is the most essential element to safeguard in order to achieve supremacy over another. And it is the most essential element to undermine when dismantling the source of another's power. What this means is, is basically from the beginning of time, food was power. It still is power. A lot of us don't realize this is the United States of America. Western imperialism was driven by livestock farmers needing more land, exploiting more land, taking land, and coming all the way to the beginning of the United States. In, uh, at the beginning of this country, 99% of everyone who came here was a farmer. And so all the laws that have since been created were designed to help trade and protect, help trade agreements between groups and protect the farmer. The difference now is that the population is no longer the majority farmer. So weird how they have so much control. So this, this quote is saying that it's basically used as an oppressive state. Food, controlling the food system is oppressive. And uh, so I'm going to move on to headlines. This is important because these are just in the last basically about 365 days. So um, the food system has been rigged basically since about 1933. In 1933, after the Great De during the Great Depression, FDR started creating a bunch of um, legislation that basically kick-started the economy. One of those pieces was that as people were buying food because they couldn't afford it, farmers were, were basically going hungry themselves. Instead of allowing that, he was afraid that the whole system would collapse, so he created the Agriculture Act in 1933. It used all of our taxes to, to buy the oversupply, and then the oversupply was distributed to the poor. The problem was, is this kick-started an oversupply problem that was bailed out over and over and over again. So November 2018, a $12 billion program to help farmers was, was, uh, was propped up. So a lot of people have heard in the headlines the Chinese tariffs, right? The Chinese tariffs actually affect a lot of industries, electronics, trade, trade across um, cars, you name it. The only industry that seems to ever get a bailout is the agriculture industry. And the truth is, the agriculture industry already uses our tax dollars to get insurance policies that mitigate this anyway. So they already are way ahead of this, where if any loss they get, they're already backed by insurance. So why do they need a bailout on top of it? Um, let's see. Okay. Next headline. So this is very polarizing, right? Because we see these headlines and we think we're winning you see that milk sales fell $1.1 billion. So you see at any grocery store that milk, plant-based milk, has 20 to 30% of shelf space, right? Um, I lived in Oklahoma for a short amount of time, and even in the most podunk city, plant-based milk has 20 to 30% of shelf space. Shouldn't that equate to less cows being abused in that system? Well, that's what we think, because we think, we think the food system is dictated by supply and demand, and we think that the food system is, is based on a capitalist design. It's not. So sales fell. This is, uh, I think this article was in either um, Bloomberg or uh, Reuters. But basically, um, one point, you have a 13.6 billion uh, sales in 2018 versus 14.7 billion in 2017. You have a 1.1 billion decrease. Um, next, May 2019, I want you to recognize these people that stand behind every presidential candidate and put pressure on our Congress. These are, this is the Farm Bureau. 
The Farm Bureau is one of the most powerful lobbying groups in the United States right now. They are pulling strings, not just for Trump, but for Bernie as well, right? Both of them, Bernie and Trump, and I'll get into this later, are, are essentially polar opposites in social policy and people policy, but with agriculture, they're fairly similar. They are uh, under the thumb of big agriculture. Bernie will say things that make you think he's not, um, but I'll, I'll tell you what's really happening. I'm not trying to get you to change your mind about voting for him. What I want you to understand is when big ag is the only lobbying group that's pressuring every politician, they get every politician under their thumb. We need to go in there and we need to contest that. So you see all these cowboy hats. This guy's name is Zippy Duvall. He's the president of the Farm Bureau. Um, you have the Secretary of Agriculture um, standing to Trump's right side. You have the Texas Farm Bureau um, guy, Russell, standing behind him. And then you have another um, high level uh, agriculture. No animal rights people, right? Um, we're, not, we're not pulling strings in Congress. Um, Continuing to more headlines. Again, I'm just building context. I, I know that this is this clicker doesn't want to click. Um, so after the 12 billion in November, this is June. Another 16 billion dollars. These are our tax dollars. See, the thing is, is this isn't just the government. This is our taxes, and we can't just be like, oh well, what are we supposed to do? We need to figure out what to do. So Trump gives 16 billion June 2019. Trump, in July 2019, I want to point this out because this is the polarity of how in control the agriculture industry is. Trump talks a lot about building a wall because of undocumented, uh, undocumented workers and undocumented immigrants coming in and basically um, using up our medical and our this and our that. And I'm half Hispanic, so um, I want you to understand that that is very polarizing because at the same time, the same week he's pressuring to get a wall built, He's also loosening the undocumented requirements for agriculture, which is a huge driver. 78% of their workers, according to the Department of Labor, not according to, um, I don't want to call it fake news, but not according to media that wants you to believe differently. According to the Department of Labor, 78% of, of big ags workers are, are undocumented workers. 75% are Hispanic. So the biggest driver of undocumented workers is the ag industry. So when people see people that look like they aren't speaking English and they are working in the farm industry and they're you know in these um, in these rural areas, they think a wall is somehow going to prevent that. It's not going to prevent that because they're basically getting VIP'd through this system right where they're supposed to be. The industry saves. Yep, it's it's in, it's like indentured servitude. So. Um, the industry saves about 30% for these workers, and they'll make you believe that the whole system will collapse without them. It's not true. The agriculture industry in 2011 and 13, I believe, was the most profitable industry in the United States, right? So how is it that they're making us feel like they can't absorb 30% cost of labor by hiring American citizens? They absolutely can absorb it. So this was a, the headline here is I want you to understand that Agriculture pulls these strings because if, if Trump or anyone else, any conservative, and I'm, again, this, is, this conversation is even for conservatives, right? I'm not saying this is a liberal conversation. If anybody really wants to go to the source of undocumented Im, uh, immigrants, we would, we would make sure that we're not bailing out the industry time and time again, who's hiring them, and we wouldn't loosen um, you know, the requirements for these workers. Okay, more headlines. Um, what's that? Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, it'd be better if that. Okay, so then in August, we see the Amazon is burning, and cattle farming in the Amazon is cause, causing mass deforestation. Again, the agriculture lobby is the one who pressures the Brazilian government to allow this to happen. The Brazilian government know, is so in bed with the agriculture industry, they will literally uh, allow them to do this. So this is all political as well. You can go back to the next one down. Keep it, yeah. Okay, this is right now, literally like four days ago. Okay, four days ago, America's pile of uneaten bacon is the biggest in 48 years. Okay, so right now, more than 40 million pounds of pork bellies is we're sitting in refrigerated warehouses. 
This happens because of our tax dollars once again. Veganism is absolutely working. Our vegan consumerism is absolutely working. So this is criminal. You basically, you basically are going to tell us that you're not going to abide by supply and demand. You're going to obliterate our um, communities that are near these factory farms. You're going to ruin our planet. You are going to make a bunch of animals suffer. You are going to put people through suffering. And you're going to put them in a refrigerator. Like, this isn't even given to the needy. It is literally people that are food insecure. This goes straight into refrigeration. It's perishable. And so year after year, they, they just replenish it, and that stockpile just grows bigger and bigger. Can you press down again? All right. So each week, we see so much polarity in the news. One week, it's Beyond Meat is a unicorn stock that had the biggest IPO since 2000 at 163%. Basically, the biggest increase of any um, stock since BlackBerry. Right? Uber didn't, didn't do that. This is a plant-based company. Um, and then you see the rainforest destruct destruction. To the next day, it's Burger King launching a vegan burger. To Kentucky Fried Chicken testing a vegan option. This is confusing. And so nobody really knows if we're winning or losing. And what I'm here to tell you is I follow the USDA production numbers. I've been tracking this for over a year. And I'm telling you that our veganism and our vegan consumerism is very powerful, but right now when our taxes are being taken, it's making plant-based companies very well off. It's not saving the animals that we intended to save. It's a horrible truth. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you why. Um, so I, I actually, do I intend to, yep. So despite veganism rising, this is the topic starter. We have one of the biggest stocks, or I'm sorry, um, with Beyond Meat creating one of the biggest stock surges in the last 20 years, not one less animal has died. In fact, production continues to increase. Um, some people might say the 20,000 or so increase in our population in the United States would create this. Then people talk about global demand. The reality is our taxes are, are what's supporting all of this. <coughs> so the, the headlines are the context. This is where I'm going with this. First, we went vegan. Next, we became activists. Now we must lobby. Who am I and why is my new fo focus in politics? So I actually am nicknamed Vegan Batgirl. Um, I started my vegan journey about 10 years ago, so I've been vegan almost 10 years. Um, after that, I don't, you know, social media started bringing to light activism and I actually became an activist. I started doing other people's activism, marching the street, holding up signs, and I just didn't feel as effective as I could, especially in Los Angeles, as where I live and even the Bay Area, to go to an event, you're dealing with so much traffic. To get to make an event successful, you have to organize and bring dozens to hundreds of people. One person can do something, but many people can do a lot. I basically, um, 2016, I saw an article that had a projection that said F Trump on the side of an Atlanta hotel. It was a giant light projection. And it could be seen across the sky um, because it was giant letters that said F Trump and the article said no one could figure out how to shut this guy down. So the police came and they're like, well, he's on a sidewalk, so it's legal. He's not vandalizing because it's light. He's not trespassing because he's across the street. Like, we don't know. He's not advertising anything. We don't know how to shut him down. And I was like, oh, my God. I need to figure out what this guy's doing. So see how that projector works. There is a high-powered light that I, I used, and I started projecting on walls. And, and my name became Vegan Batman Light, Vegan Batgirl. I was doing it everywhere, on Staples Center, on Vegas hotels. Um, I'm, I actually moved to Oklahoma, and I mean, you imagine the beef industry and everyone there. They didn't know what to do with me. Helicopters would come. Their police drones would come. People would, like, try to run me over. It was like a reality TV show, and a lot of people wanted to learn how to do the Batman light. And I thought, this was a couple years ago, I'm gonna launch a bunch of Batman lights all over the United States, so everyone's shining these messages that they don't need 50 people to show up, they need one or two people to put the light up on a building. For three hours, that light can generate 10, 20,000 eyeballs, and you can say things very directly. You can look at that on veganbatgirl.com if you're ever interested. Um, I'm in the advertising data industry. What that means is it started very much with advertising like TV and turned into online advertising, but 
now everything is data. All of it is audiences and data and what they're doing. And, and I, you know, you see vegan audiences when someone, when a plant-based company wants to advertise to vegan audience, it shows the vegan audience upwards of 20 million people. That is way more than they make us feel, way more than 3% of the population, right? They, they make us feel like we're really small. Um, when you look at the data, it's, it's telling a different story. Um, so the reality is, is over the 10 years of time, I'm like, okay, veganizing people left and right with the Batman light, let's launch these in other cities and states. Um, you're seeing shelf space of vegan items increase. You're seeing fast food places. I'm watching the USDA production number year after year. I'm like, it's going to go down. It's going to go down. Why isn't it going down? And then I see these bailouts, and I see them increasing. And then I catch wind of the stockpile. There is a stockpile. So um, if we can go, if you can press down. Um, this is talking about who I am. I'm going to go down again. Um, basically, I found a bunch of articles that said that the food system is rigged. It's been rigged since 1933. It's continued to increase. They basically use our taxes to such a degree now that it wipes clean of all of their losses. Um, that Remember that $1.1 billion loss that dairy had? The, dairy's producing the same amount and scheduled to produce even more in 2020. They'll ask for another bailout. It's just like clockwork. Um, now, my issue is you might look at me and think that I've been, I don't know, because I'm talking about this, been political for a very long time. I haven't. I want all of us to not be intimidated by politics because I really didn't, I was an anarchist. I didn't give a shit about politicians. I felt like they was just picking the lesser of two evils. I was presented with someone and I was like, I don't feel like I know enough about them. They're just pandering to some one issue. Um, the issues are always the same that they talk about. It's always gun issues, abortion issues. Um, and, and what side of that, it's about welfare versus not. It's always the same issues to get you confused and for you to not realize what's really happening with your taxes. So, Big Ag is one of the most organized, uncontested lobbying groups that exists and gets Congress to help them rig the food system by using our taxes to pay for all their overhead costs. So you hear about subsidies and you may have heard of the Farm Bill. Subsidies and bailouts are different. Subsidies is like welfare. Don't ever let somebody who talks about helping farmers ever, ever over scrutinize someone with low income that needs help with groceries. Don't ever let them do that because that is not right to be okay with farmers getting welfare and people who need food, it's not okay. Especially when farmers can get $125,000 to $900,000 in welfare and a person with groceries can get $150 per person. So at most, let's say they, let's say they gamed the system how many? How much money in groceries could they get? Seven hundred dollars? That's not nine hundred thousand dollars. Like we can't continue to allow people to make us feel like one type of welfare is okay. Subsidies in the food system is welfare, flat out. It's your taxes helping somebody who, in this case, is very very well off. So subsidies pay for overhead costs, like like the feed for the animals, the land for the animals, the equipment for the animals. We pay for all of their overhead costs and their insurance policies and make them be able to sell meat for cheaper. So that way, when meat is cheaper, it's more accessible to everybody. Every socioeconomic condition in the United States has McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken and Carl's Jr's littered around because our, our tax dollars pay for their overhead costs. That's why there are, that's why Fruit smoothies cost eight, nine, ten dollars, and a cow who's fifteen hundred pounds lands on a dollar menu. So that's the first way they use our taxes. The second way is they use our taxes to bail them out when they're not selling the products. Whether it's international trade, whether it's domestic, for every domestic person that stops eating meat, you better believe that they've found an international market to use our tax dollars to market to that market, create a trade agreement and find an international consumer, right? So when someone says, well, what about global demand? It's increasing, so, so technically demand's increasing. Yeah, but if it would be like someone saying, um, Tesla is no longer selling in the United States, so our tax dollars are gonna help them market to Japan. Like, 
Why would we do that? We would never do that. We would never allow them to take our taxes to do a better job in a different market. Um, and that's what we're doing with ag. So, so here's what this looks like. This is the 2018 stockpile and the 2019 production despite the low demand the year prior. The 2018, if this worked off of supply and demand, the 2018 stockpile would signal a loss in revenue and they would never overproduce the next year if they really abided by supply and demand. They don't. The U.S. and meat cheese stockpile is over 4 billion pounds of animal products and growing. And it keeps growing because of these bailouts. Um, so 2019 production, that 1.1 billion loss, if you owned a business, any entrepreneurs in here, if you took a hit, would you really overproduce the next year? That's dangerous. You could lose your whole livelihood. They'll go after, they'll go after your house, they'll go after your car. You would never do that if you had to risk that. Nope, dairy increased production in 2019. Meat also increased production. 2018 and 19 bailouts, those go back to the, the new slides. 2018, $12 billion, 2019, $16 billion. 2020, negotiating another large bailout right now, I believe it's about $20 billion. You'll see Trump announce it. Trump, the reason this becomes part of the voting cycle is because they started this country. They gerrymandered districts to this country to give farmer rural populations bigger electoral power and votes. So that's why Bernie, Elizabeth Warren, Trump all try to get farmers on their side. It doesn't matter if they're liberal or conservative. Um, you can go to the next slide. I just want to reiterate though on this, if there was the demand, there would not be a continuous stockpile. So whatever somebody tells you that, oh, but the overall human population is growing, oh, but this, oh, but that, there would not be a stockpile. Okay. This is the USDA numbers. This is a straight spreadsheet from the USDA, what I was talking about, about production. You can see the production in 2018. You can see the increase of 0.2% from 2018 to 2019. Despite 1.1 billion loss, they still increased it. This is criminal. I, I don't know about you, but this pisses me off. Now, before, the Connie before was like, well, I'm doing everything I can. That's how I felt. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Um, I want you, this is how I want you to see. So Bernie's at the bottom with, with farmers, farmers for Bernie. Trump's at the top with his Make Farmers Great Again hat. No, I don't know if you saw that, but he has a green hat that literally he's tossing out to farmers. He's almost making fun of it, like, here's money, here's money, here's money. Um, it, if you see that video, it's, it, it looks exactly like that. He is tossing hats out, Make Farmers Great Again green hats literally like it's dollars because it was $28 billion. And he's like, you're going to vote for me. You're going to vote for me. You're going to vote for me. And your vote is more important, right? That's exactly what it is. So I don't want you, if you were thinking about voting for Bernie, I don't want you to negate that idea. What I want you to understand is you are voting for Bernie for his people policies. You are not voting for him for his animal policies because his animal policies are the antithesis of what this movement needs. Now, you can have wishful thinking all you want. You can talk about the environment. His environmental policies right now, including the Green Deal, actually is allowing the agriculture industry to take tax dollars, more tax dollars, to what? Hand over their manure. It's not even asking them to reduce their footprint. It's saying, make your manure reusable. They've hijacked the Green Deal. Does that make sense? The biggest contributor that should be regulated by the Green Deal is getting tax subsidies to hand over their manure as an energy source. So this is what I want us to understand. If you can go down. How do we solve this? Paralysis is not the way anymore. Um, I. When I saw these numbers and when I saw the articles talking about how much of, like it was a scam almost, this was happening, this, this doesn't, we, we live in a country that everybody talks about capitalism and they look down and snub their nose at socialism, but only when it's for the public. This is corporate socialism at its finest. And so at the end of the day, 
I was like, okay, where's our federal lobbying group? I searched and searched. I'm like, there has to be one, right? Are you expecting with as much loyalty as how much veganism is, has grown, all these plant-based companies, VegFest popping up in every city, you expect that we're represented with a lobbying group in Congress, right? Cigars and balloons are represented in Congress. Vegans have to be represented federally in Congress. The reality is, is there is a few, a few groups that are, and one are working kind of on a health angle. You have another who's working state by state with, with definitions like milk and meat um, when, they, when they try to make plant-based companies not be able to use those words, right? So I don't know if you know this, but in certain states when they make the word, um, let's say, uh, milk not be allowed to use by plant-based companies, that plant-based company has to create different packaging for their product just in that state alone. I don't know if you know that, but they, they, right. So there's a lobbying group that helps them with that, and they're busy with that because it's happening left and right. I wanted to see if there was a federal group that was actually laser focused on reducing the stockpile. Um, and so when I didn't really find one, I'm like, I just, I'm going to find the right people and I'm going to start one. So I founded, thank you. Um, I founded Vegan Justice League. Vegan Justice League turn, has turned into the educational arm, and I'm going to introduce Agriculture Fairness Alliance. I want you to kind of think of them as um, lobbying doesn't allow a nonprofit to, you know, there's, there's just certain things like a nonprofit can't get politically aligned. So Agriculture Fairness Alliance is the lobbying arm that can get politically aligned. So I founded Vegan Justice League um, a, a year ago. My co-founder actually was doing something very similar. She, you can find an HBO video of her named Laura Reese. And Laura Reese um, worked with a group called Lobbyists for Good, which essentially teaches the public how to lobby and get involved. And so, um, so at that same time, so an HBO special was done about how the public can lobby and get their voices heard. We came together and we've been organizing, educating, and getting people to realize that being a lobbying member is a duty. I want you to understand that at a veg festival, people probably spend about $5 in gas, they probably spend $10 to $20 in food, and all across the United States, anywhere from 2,500 people to 20,000 people show up at these events. If 10,000 people spent five bucks, you have a lobbyist for one year. We can do this. We ha so every social justice movement in the past, by the way, I don't, someone needs to tell me the time check. I think I'm almost, um, I'm all right, but. Uh, so anyways, every social justice movement of our past, believe it or not, started with a lobbying group who then became the marching group. We're kind of marching and just thinking we can march with a sign outside the White House and think that our demands are gonna be met. I don't want to negate activism. I'm an activist by heart. So anyways, specifically, we wanna bring supply and demand back to agriculture. The next farm bill is voted in by 2023, but we're not gonna sit around until 2023. Our first piece of legislation, this is where Agriculture Fairness Alliance comes in, agriculturefairnessalliance.org is the lobbying arm. Our first piece of legislation launches this week. The news is gonna come out, um, press releases, hopefully vegan, um, vegan magazines and news, online news will, will support it and announce it. The legislation is an at-risk farmer um, transition and diversification program. Renee from Rowdy Girl Sanctuary, Renee King Sonnen, if you've ever heard of her, she was a, a rancher's wife who transitioned her, her, her farm, the cattle farm, into a, a sanctuary. When that happened, um, you know, she started receiving inquiries from a lot of farmers who wanted to do the same thing. They needed help to get out of livestock farming and help to transition. Her public program, when we caught wind of it, we were like, why not create legislation instead of throwing them bailout money the bailout money they fail anyway and the animals end up in a stockpile, why not use legislation that's bipartisan, not just liberal, because that's what we, when we mess up, when we just base it off of animal rights, like that is, that is the underlayer, but when we don't tie it to bipartisan angles, it, it will never get picked up and sponsored. So what we did was we essentially expanded on that public program and we created legislation to where our tax dollars will support 
at-risk farmers who are at risk to failing to get tax dollars to transition their livestock farming into plant-based, regenerative, non-exploitive farming. And we're very proud that legislation hits Congress this week and uh, you know, we, we do it because of our donating members. You can click down. So remember me talking about social justice. Um, this is a Martin Luther King quote. So while it may be true that morality cannot be legislated, but behavior can be regulated. This is really important, okay? Because social activism is still so important. It's so important because you're changing the moral compass or you're realigning people back with, with that moral compass. But laws are important as well. So it may be true that the law can't change the heart, but it can restrain the heartless. It may be true that the law can't make a man love me, but it can restrain him from lynching me. And I think that is pretty important also. So while the law does not change the hearts of men, it does change the habits of men if it is vigorously enforced. And that is the message that I'm coming here with today. We, first we went vegan, then we became activist, and now we must lobby. We must change the way our taxes are being used. It's thievery in my opinion. I am, I am so consciously making sure that my shoes aren't leather, my purses aren't leather, that, that nothing on me or in my house exploits an animal and if someone tells me it exploits a human I stop buying that as well I buy local jewelry um, and and beyond and I know all of you do a very good job of doing the same thing and, and as your consciousness builds you do that but then your taxes are taken out 20 to 40 percent of them every year and it's going to do the opposite of what your intention was and all those animals you thought you were saving they're just saying hey we have your taxes so what can you do so if you click down to the next, so I'm going to go to the appendix really fast. Um, click down. Yep. So this is a quick what's in the farm bill. Um, we have this in, on our website. So it's one of the most contested bills in Congress. It gets, uh, it gets um, negotiated every four to five years. It goes back and forth between um, House of Reps and, uh, and Senators. Um, it basically is a beautiful thing in their mind because it's bipartisan as well. So while they talk down to SNAP recipients, they want SNAP recipients. SNAP recipients are demand, right? It's our taxes paying for them to buy meat and dairy at a cheap cost. So um, the original Agriculture Act of 1933 was just agriculture related. They, they, they tied in welfare programs um, Lyndon B. Johnson actually officially did that, and Lyndon B. Johnson grew up on a farm, so he was like the mastermind of making it bipartisan. Before it was bipartisan, they started losing the vote of urban um, politicians, and rightfully so, right? The, the U.S. changed where from 99% farmers, now less than 2% of, of the um, Americans are farmers, yet they're still one of the strongest and most controlling um, industries in our country. But again, every one of us eats. Not every one of us owns a home. Not every one of us drives. Every one of us eats. And he who controls the food controls the world. Um, it expires every four to five years. Less than 1%. This stat is so important. Less than 1% goes to fruit and veggies direct to consumer. All of our subsidies go to livestock or livestock feed. So a good 70% of it is actually to soy. But not soy that any of these companies can access. It's only soy that livestock get. So we can't even benefit off of subsidized soy. Our vegan products can't even benefit off of them. Um, another thing that people don't realize, and this is a conservative angle, right? We talked about undocumented, undocumented workers. The other conservative angle is that, um, is that uh, the, the loophole of global companies receiving our taxes. So while 70% of that feed um, is for livestock. It's not just for U.S. livestock. It's international. So our taxes are basically feeding international livestock. Right now, the tariffs from China, the the you know the big bailouts that happened because of the tariffs in China, though the, what was getting affected was pork exports as well as soy feed, sorghum, sorghum soy meal feed for China's livestock. 
So a conservative, that's a, a conservative angle, right? Conservatives don't want our tax dollars supporting global economies as welfare to them. So um, you want to go to the next slide, which is these are what are specifically in the farm bill. Um, fixed pricing. Fixed pricing is essentially saying that um, kind of what it sounds like, that if if the if a farmer doesn't make a certain amount that we pay the difference so we already do that through the farm bill but beyond that um, so what Bernie is releasing is he's releasing his version of so Trump is gonna try to pander the farmer vote by I think giving another 20 billion or so in 2020 Bernie is releasing his version which is that he's gonna release fixed pricing fixed pricing means that um, essentially uh, that supply and demand literally will not exist. The government will set the supply, whether the farmer um, receives that demand or not, he gets paid directly no matter what. What Bernie is doing is he's expanding it to small farmers. So right now, big agriculture usually gives subsidies to, to farmers with um, over 10,000 head count of, animal, of animals. Now you're starting to see Bernie and others expand that upon small farmers. So small farmers, believe it or not, are actually really struggling. And when, when you do hear the small farmer sob story, it's happening. The problem is, is that big ag uses that to create a narrative. So they're like, oh, all these small farmers are failing. It's, a, it's not American for us to not help them and this and that. Well, it would be like the defense industry, like, like coming in Halliburton using veterans' mental health issues and, and suicide numbers and other things to get more money from the United States and sending it off to build airplane, like, you know, um, defense airplanes. Like, that's how messed up it is. They are using the small farmer narrative to make us feel sorry for them take our taxes and not and no one says otherwise you don't hear, ever hear someone saying I can't believe my taxes are helping farmers no one ever says that um, because they use a small farmer narrative the the big um, the big elite agriculture does there's also insurance policies the insurance policies are very problematic because there's no oversight so they have overseas banks that support these insurance policies our tax dollars pay those premiums and then what happens is, is that they have laws that prevent us from actually having any transparency to see what claims they've done. It's my belief that they are triple dipping in these insurance policies. I think they take a weather insurance policy, they take a margin insurance policy, and then they take you know, um, a, a death insurance policy. And I think they make a claim on the same animal with all three policies. And then they get a bailout, right? So I think, it's just think of it, <laughs> like if you owned an auto uh, car dealership and you got flood you got flood insurance you got damage insurance and you got um, I don't know gap insurance and you made you, you made three claims for that same 40,000 vehicle and you basically got 40,000 times three so I think they're profiting off of the insurance policies um, so anyways that's another part of it you can click on down Okay, so I'm gonna definitely open it up for questions. So this again, um, these are some stats. If you wanna take a picture, I don't know if it's big enough, but it talks about the agriculture's workforce. 98% of all farmer subsidy recipients are white, making it one of the most systemically racist profiles of all industries of who is in control to who is exploited. Remember the 78% undocumented immigrants. Um, and then subsidies is really welfare for the rich in this situation. Many are farm investors, they don't even live on the farm. Their families, that they up the caps in how much they can get. Um, each individual can get up to $900,000, a farm owner can. Their wife can get another $900,000 for $1.8 million. They can create a mega farm family where every uh, child, niece, nephew, and cousin can get $125,000. So these farmers are millionaires by each of those people. The only requirement is that those people show up on the farm one time a month. They don't have to work there. A lot of their addresses are in Manhattan. It is a fail-proof investment. They have gamed the system. So I'm going to open it up um, to questions. VeganJusticeLeague.com will send you, if you try to donate to agriculturefairnesslines.org, the only reason it jumps you over there is, again, the, the lobbying aspect. Um, and we need donations. Our lobbyists will hit a certain hour 
and recurring donations help us continue putting pressure and getting the sponsors so that this can change. My name is Connie Spence. I want to thank you so much for listening to me, and I'm going to open up for questions if anyone has them. The Green Deal. Yep. Hundred percent. Yeah. So, um, on Agriculture Fairness Alliance, you'll see four pillars. One of the pillars is to conservatives because the reality is, is we need to hit all angles of this. It affects every single one of us. If if a conservative really believes that they don't want more government. Um, welfare, more government control, if they really believe that, then they'd be against how our tax dollars are, are, are essentially propping it up to your point. Um, you have the undocumented immigrant angle, you have the, you have the um, big government angle, you have the welfare angle, you have all of those angles that conservatives do say they, they're against. And so we just, have to, we just have to make sure that when we're talking to different audiences, we are telling them what they want to hear. You can't force the animal morality issue down everybody's throat. The reality of this is this exploitation crosses over so many groups of people, not it, so many groups of people that we can get on our side. Agriculture Fairness Alliance wants to be an alliance that is vegan backed and abolition based, but we could represent small farmers. We could represent food inequity. We could represent undocument, undocumented workers. We could represent so many groups to become the majority because right now vegans aren't the majority. So that's how that's how we're going to surface, um, you know, more power politically. Yes, Does, I I wanted to answer as much of the question I could, and thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, <coughs> So I, I'm a big dreamer like you. Um, 2023, what I'm hoping is this legislation creates the relationship so that the farm bill will become easier to change. We also do DIY, do-it-yourself um, lobbying webinars so that we can teach everybody how they can locally, through their house rep or senator, um, create a, launch a meeting, have a very powerful conversation, and hold, hold our politicians accountable. We cannot be intimidated by this every movement. I don't just want vegans to be the only one that uses their public ability to be lobbying, lobbying members and have lobbying power. We have allowed corporate corporations to basically blanket all of the government with their lobbying money. That's why the NRA is so powerful. That is why agriculture is so powerful. Um, we could easily be just as powerful. We need to realize that there are almost double the amount of vegans as there are farmers. Just centralizing our money together and having a clear voice that's that's contesting them in politics. One more question or what how much time do I have? Okay. Last question then. Oh thank I, I yeah, thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so there are a lot of them on the billionaire list. Um, some of these farmer fam yeah, uh, a lot of these farmer families are investors, and what they do is they they create an indentured servitude type of situation where they're taking the taxes, 
and they have a farmer leasing their land and tending to their land and then they hire undocumented workers to basically have you know cheap labor so the families um, EWG is uh, EWG.org I believe is a website that you can see the list of subsidies in the families there's a it's difficult to know which farms um, are owned by who on purpose they, they make it really difficult but these families you'll see taken millions of dollars and it has to do with them expanding into mega farm empires they're very elite farmers they're not I can tell you that they're really not living on the farm and they're not tending to the farm it's a different type of persona it's somebody that's very keen on investments they figured out a fail proof investment so um, Email, uh, we have a lot of resources on both websites and it'll point you to them, but if you still feel like you're not finding what you're looking for, um, email contact at, at veganjusticeleague.com and, and we can help you out. We, so donating is the primary way. Um, we absolutely need people to feel like it's a duty. If you know somebody that has extra money you know, to donate to this, send them to the, the website. I don't want anybody that's in a socioeconomic condition that can't support it to do something that they can't. The other piece is we need volunteers. We need volunteers to spread the message. We need volunteers that are willing to look in the mirror at the subject. You are vegetarian and, and you know, some people after turning vegetarian are like, well, you know what? I don't, I, I want to go vegan. Then we go vegan and it's like, we're, not, we're like, well, this isn't enough. I need to expand and get other people to go vegan. So we start active, doing activism. Activism then becomes not enough and now I'm letting you know lobbying is next level. We have to, we have to create a channel of communication to politicians. We have to make our demands and we have to hold them accountable and we can't do that by holding a sign outside. Activism augments our lobbying demands and that is it. My name is Connie. I hope you guys uh, you know, follow the website. And